He's a professor of English at Benedictine College in Kansas, and tonight he's here to discuss the work of a Catholic screenwriter and novelist in danger of being forgotten. My guest has written a new introduction and annotated a pair of American novels, Mr. Blue and Dan England and the Noonday Devil by Miles Conley. That name might not ring a bell, but you certainly know the iconic movies that he wrote and shaped. Here's my interview with Dr. Stephen Maracci. So, Stephen, tell me about Miles Conley. Uh, he was a, a, a well-known screenwriter, certainly at his time, a collaborator of Frank Capra. Yes. Why don't we hear more about him? It's not for lack of work ethic on his part. Hmm. Uh, he either wrote or produced 40 Hollywood films. Wow. And films that people know. State yeah. of the Union, for instance. Sure. Um, also, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Appropriately enough. He wrote the story also for the 1952 film adaptation of Hans Christian Andersen. Oh, the Danny Kaye movie. There we go. And that wow. ended up getting nominated for six Academy Awards. Hmm. So no doubt he was uh, a consummate storyteller. But he wrote a series of novels, four novels, correct? Four novels and one collection of short And you stories. were drawn right. to this book, Mr. Blue. He wrote it in 1928. 28, right. Why? Well, I mean, th this book, it was, pub it was in print for about 60 years. That was out of print. Right. How did you find it and what drew you to it? Seems like a kind of dated piece of its era. Hmm. Well, I, originally a student said to me, Dr. Maracci, I think you'd be interested in this book. He said, I enjoyed many aspects of it, but it left me with some questions. Hmm. And I said, well, great literature often does leave us with hmm. questions, That's, but I was interested. So I read it. And have you ever had that experience where you're reading a book and you just start to spontaneously put notes in the margins. Yes, oh yes, I see where this is going. Mm -hmm. I like, you, you just kind of, you spontaneously pick it up and do it. Huh. So that happened with my experience of Mr. Blue. I finished the book and I said, wow, I, this spoke to me. Huh. So then I taught it in my Christianity and literature class. And you taught it with Chesterton's biography of St. Francis. That's correct, right. And saw what? What were the similarities? One came out, the Chesterton book came out, what, four years before I believe, Mr. Blue? I believe four, yeah. So you think he read it? Oh, without a doubt. And, and you saw reflections in Mr. Blue. Why? Tell uh, us about the story. Well, first of all, Miles Connolly was writing about Chesterton throughout his career. Hmm. Even uh, as early as 1921, he was, what, 24, 25 years old at this hmm. point, and he was already writing articles on Chesterton. He, was, he might have been one of America's greatest advocates for the genius of Chesterton, even as early as the 1920s. Amazing. Uh, so, yeah, so we, we read the, the St. Francis biography by Chesterton. And so, for example, one of the distinctions that Chesterton makes is the difference between St. Francis before vocation considered himself a troubadour, a yeah, bard, right. almost of the world, right? But when he takes up his vocation, he becomes a jongleur. <laughs> he becomes the great bard of the fool of God, mm. as it were. And this, this is an important distinction. And, and how does this relate to Mr. Blue? And what is Mr. Blue about? And why should these people care? Right, so Mr. Blue is often called the modern St. Francis story mm. uh, because the main character, Blue, does exactly that. He goes from being a troubadour, someone who enjoys the world but isn't quite living his vocation fully, the mm. calling that he's mm. being pulled to. So he inherits a lot of money. Gives he it all away. Gives it all away. And then in a very slowly developed throughout the book, he eventually comes to the decision, I've got to minister to the poorest of the poor. Mm. And so eventually we see him giving himself to the poorest of the poor and living among them. Now this is 1928, yeah. right? So over the next 20 years, the Catholic worker movement becomes very popular in the United States. You know, Servant of God, Dorothy Day and mm -hmm. others. And people start saying, remember that book, Mr. Blue? Didn't, wasn't that about someone who did this? Hmm. And so the book starts to sell. Oh, so that's the when book he came back. That's right. That's what, yeah, the first few years, it, it barely sold at all. Not even the Catholic press liked it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, a, you read some of the Catholic reviews at the time, and they're not fans. It's too oh, bad. Wow. And Connolly himself said, yeah, this book was almost ignored when it first came out. Now, mm. for the record, so was Gatsby, but yeah. never mind. Well, and, and it's interesting, you raised Gatsby. The, the character, the prime character in this book is Jay Blue. Jay Blue, Is right. this a response to Jay Gatsby? Now, the first person the who Fitzgerald mentioned class. this was the Jesuit, John Breslin, who wrote mm. an article mm. about this. And uh, I, so I read that, and what I did is I took that and I ran with it a little bit, and I started showing that, yeah, there was more than a passing uh, influence here. Mm -hmm. you know, Connolly was responding to Fitzgerald's you know, quasi-Catholic approach mm -hmm. to that, and there are all kinds of references, almost word-for-word -word references to Gatsby that Connolly inverts ah. and turns around. 
Hmm. Okay. And so, so it is almost a, re a cultural response to. Without a doubt, it is. Yes. Why do you consider this his greatest legacy, given this guy was responsible or had a hand in rewriting by Frank Capra's own admission? Yeah. It happened one night. Mr. Smith goes to Washington, uh, right. State of the Union. The wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. That's not an impressive legacy and more impressive than Mr. Blue? They work together. Okay. They're all of a piece. Why? Well, first of all, Capra described their relationship as if we weren't embracing, we were, uh, I forget the word he uses, but basically he calls it a love-hate relationship. Mm -hmm. And here's why. But he was not his greatest because, critic. Yeah, not because we were just passionate, mm -hmm. but because Connolly hurt sometimes because he was right. In other words, Connolly had the ability to be incredibly charming. He had master skills of debate, people said. Everyone said this guy, I believe he was salutatorian of his class in Boston College. Mm. So he had these masterful skills of debate. He was a wonderful conversationalist. And he could point out where he, you would say, he would point out where the error was and say, mm. this is where you've got to go. And if you don't, it's going to hurt worse. Yeah. And so this he is helped him with happens. story structure and character development much and that so. sort of thing, it seems. Oh, very much so, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and Frank, there's a new biography that came out about Capra that posits this very thing. That says, really? yeah, it just came out a few years ago. I believe McBride was the author. Uh -huh. And he said Connolly was even more of an influence on Capra than a lot of people are willing to admit. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, Dan England and the oh, New yeah. Day Devil, which is the newest book uh, that you have edited and, um, well, you've written uh, notes on. Yeah, right. right. Um, what do you call it? Introductions a, and annotations. But yeah. what do you call that? It is an, an annotated, annotated edition. edition. Correct. Um, that's what we call it. Why? That's, that's what you in <laughs> academia call that's it. That's what we do. Now, <laughs> tell me about Dan England and the Noonday Devil. This is the newest book. Why is this so critical? His daughter claims this was his most personal work. Why? Yes, that's exactly right. And that's why we decided to do that one second. Mm. Uh, it was his personal favorite. Mm. And it's a it's a little more mature than Mr. Blue in the sense that it really takes uh, an adult situation. And by that, I mean someone who has grown up in the faith a bit. Mm -hmm. You're no longer a beginner in the faith. A wide-eyed youth. Exactly. Which You're no Mr. longer. Mr. Blue is. Very oh, idealistic. Very much so. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. It works for him. Yeah. But this looks at someone who might be a proficient in the spiritual life, somebody who's moving through what we might call the classic stage of illumination. Mm -hmm. But something is preventing him from union. What is preventing him from full union with Christ? And the classic problem here, as it's said as in the title, Noonday Devil, is acedia. The distaste or the paralysis in action of not being able to do the good that God wants you to do, the greater good mm -hmm. that God mm -hmm. wants you to do. So you get stuck in lesser goods. Yeah. And lesser goods are hard to give up because they're good. Mm. But what comes with them is either a little bit of sadness or a little bit of anger, something where you say, I know I could be doing this, but I'm not. Why? No, that's acedia. Mm -hmm. And that's what this book is about. It's about a man's struggle with acedia and the very unlikely and mysterious happenstance that brings about his conversion and overcoming of that obstacle. Mm. Uh, I, I need to quote Conley to you. In 1951, in an interview, he said, to me, a book is Catholic if it tells in concrete terms man's relation to his God and to, and his, to soul. his soul. Why can't some of our writers talk more about the adventure, adventure of, Catholicism. of Catholicism? That's from the Boston Pilot interview well, yeah, why, that he did in 1951. I'm going to ask you, yeah. why don't they? Dare I say they might have Catholicism wrong? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dare I say it? Maybe. But this is pulling right out of Chesterton. Now, this mm. is pulling completely out of Chesterton, the great adventure. Mm. This is how Connolly saw it. Connolly said, we need that joyful laughter, that joyful mirth. That is the last line of orthodoxy. Some, yeah. If Jesus hid anything from us, it was his mirth. So with all the literature out there, with everything available mm. to people, and miniseries, and now you can stream everything down, why do we need Miles Connolly, and why have you so devoted so much of your time, your career, sure. to um, preserving his legacy and extending it? Good. Is Miles Connolly lived the spiritual life very deeply and very joyfully. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, he was an amazing storyteller mm -hmm. and he had the literary skills to be a great storyteller. And he insisted one does not substitute for the other, mm -hmm. like Flannery O'Connor always insisted, wow. etc. We don't have, at least in the American tradition, we don't have a whole lot of novels that are successful in both telling very good stories from a literary point of view as good works of art mm -hmm. and telling stories of the journey of the spirit. Mm -hmm. 
the journey from purgation through mm -hmm. illumination to union. Doing those two things at the same time is, in my experience Hard at least, slog. rare. Mm -hmm. You can go wrong just a little bit. Connolly doesn't, and uh, his restraint is admirable. Huh. And I think that's why I'll, there's so much that's going on in his books, which is why I did the annotations. Mm -hmm. That is under the surface. To unveil those secrets. Just so, look, I mean, he, one of Connolly's sisters was a Carmelite nun. And Connolly himself shows, shows in his work a very good understanding of Carmelite spirituality. And you see traces of it all over. Well, the place. and in this book, you note uh, not only Carmelite spirituality, Jesuit spirituality, Franciscan spirituality, Franciscan, right. and he distinguishes throughout. He does, yeah. He distinguishes them and their particular contributions and how they all work together in a certain sense hmm. to move the main character through different states of soul. What's right. next? Ah, so uh, next, we, I've contracted with Clooney to do all of Miles Connolly's works. Oh boy. Yeah, which is five books total, four novels, one collection of short stories. Hmm. And so uh, I believe we're, next one we're going to do is The Bump on Brannigan's Head, hmm. which the Connolly estate affectionately calls The Bump. <laughs> the Bump. Well, I believe I'll be next. It's, it's a nice moniker. Uh, thank you. Thanks thank you for so being much. Here. Thanks so much, Raymond. Stephen Maracci's annotated versions of Miles Connolly's classic novels, Mr. Blue and Dan England and the Noonday Devil are available now at bookstores everywhere.